If you'll open your Bibles up, we're going to go to the book of Matthew today. And this is a parable and a sermon that is entitled, A Treasure Hidden in a Field. A Treasure Hidden in a Field. So we'll be in Matthew 13, starting in verse 44. Matthew 13, verse 44. We're just going to read three verses here. Matthew 13, 44 says, And the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. And then in his joy, he goes and sells all he has and buys the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one of great value went and sold all he had and bought it. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we tremble at your word. We rejoice at the sound of your word. Lord, we we're hungry for your word. We're hungry for the life that comes from the truth that comes from your mouth or to our ears. Lord, our faith is built through the word of God. And Lord, I pray that our our hearts would be open to receive by the power of the Spirit of God. Lord, that we wouldn't get callous to the fact that we are in this chapel every morning or callous to the fact that God's Word is so readily available to us that we would look at it as casual, God. Lord, I pray that our hearts would be open and soft to the truth and the power and the beauty and the salvation that comes from the written Word of God, Lord, that is lived out before us and modeled for us by the living word of God, Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray that we would truly have eyes to see the truth. And God, I pray that that your name would be lifted high in this chapel, God, and that your name would be lifted high through my preaching. And Lord, that your name would be lifted high through every saint in here that confesses Christ as Savior in their life, God. And Lord, that we would look at ourselves in contrast to the Scripture And we would ask basic questions. Lord, if this is what it means to be saved, am I saved? Lord, if this is what it means to glorify you, does my life glorify you? Are you the central focus of my life? Lord, we love you. And we pray that in this moment that you would be the central focus of our life. And more and more, God, that you would be the everything of our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. In this 13th chapter of the book of Matthew... We have eight different kingdom parables. The first four having to do with men's various responses to the gospel, to Jesus Christ, to the preaching of the kingdom of God. And this gospel is the only entrance by which we will have salvation and eternal life with Christ. There has to come a moment in your life. There has to come a moment in your life where everything changes. The way you see everything, like you just woke up from a dream you've been living in your whole life. Or like the Apostle Paul would say, that you were dead and now you're alive. Or you were blind and now you see. If there's not this catastrophic moment where everything changes, not that you immediately begin perfectly living out Christianity, but that you see everything is different and new, then you probably have not been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. There's only one way to the kingdom of God, and it's Jesus. And we got to be so careful that we listen to Jesus' words about what that means. It's important right from the start that we make it clear that this parable is about the gospel. It's about the kingdom, and it's about Jesus. There are people often today in theology that try to make it sound like there are two different gospels. A lot of preachers do this. They they try to make it sound like there's a gospel of salvation and a gospel of the kingdom. There aren't two gospels. The reason they do this is because they want to disjoint the, the narrow road that leads to the gospel of life and the kingdom of God from things that they surmised are kingdom principles. These aren't principles to live by. This is regeneration. This is life. It isn't saying, listen, if you act like a servant sometimes and try to be, you know, more giving, that you're going to be great. 
This is about divesting yourself of everything that stands in the way of the beauty and the majesty that is the throne room of heaven. Sing it dimly in this life, but holding fast to it like it's everything. And I would not critically just ask you to immediately examine your life and ask yourself the question, was Jesus your all in all in the weeks and months and days leading up to this place? I don't care what you did years before that. I don't care if you had an experience with Jesus. I don't care if you said a prayer when you were eight. I don't care if you were a pastor before you came here. There have been significant portions of your life where it just didn't seem that important to gaze on the beauty that is Christ. I suspect you don't really know him then. I did the same thing for years. I was a youth pastor. I was a seminary student. But I still loved the world. I believed I was saved. I believed that I had some sort of relationship with God, but it wasn't the kind of relationship that actually made me live different. That consumed the fibers of my being. And this is the message Jesus is giving to us here. There aren't two kingdoms. There aren't two gospels. There is one gospel Saying that there is a gospel of repentance and salvation and a gospel of the kingdom is false. It is unbiblical. And it comes from poor exegetical study and exposition of the Bible or from someone who is being dishonest. You cannot read the words of Jesus and come to this conclusion. A simple contextual understanding of the New Testament exposes this as fault. But those who may want to manipulate us or manipulate themselves, try to teach something different and superimpose this unbiblical theology onto the scripture. But there's only one gospel. There's only one way. There's only one kingdom. And Jesus talks in great length about this. The apostle Paul in Galatians chapter one, verse six, makes it clear that there's only one gospel. He says to the church in Galatia, I'm astonished at how quickly you're deserting him who called you into the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let them be accursed. As we have said before, and so now I say again, If anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. The Greek word anathema, meaning damned, be accursed. Paul's saying, listen, damn anybody who preaches a gospel other than Jesus Christ, because it will damn you. There's only one way. So this parable starts out like many of Jesus' parables with this phrase, the kingdom of heaven is like. All the gospel has to do with Christ and his kingdom, the holiness of God, the sinfulness of man, the grace by which we're saved, eternity with God. But a linchpin of 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 much of what Jesus said is he talks about the narrowness of the gospel, the exclusivity of the gospel in Christ. It is not wide. It is not all-inclusive. It is very exclusive. It's only found in one place, in Jesus, and that is the Jesus of the Bible. It would be in your best interest in life to find out who Jesus is through the Bible. Not from songs, as good as they might be. Not from TV shows. Not from the shack, God forbid. But from the Bible. From digging into God's word and seeing who Jesus himself said he was. What the kingdom is. And the only road to get there. Now I know I said it's going to be a softer or less harsh parable. But it is. Because there's rejoicing involved with this. But there really isn't a lot of things Jesus said that were lackadaisical or, or, you know, soft. Jesus was a man of sorrows. He was a man of suffering. That's what the Bible says. 
He preached a solid, hard message because everything about life stakes on it. We are talking about the eternal kingdom of God. In this parable, in this parable, Jesus tells us what it is truly like to see the gospel, to perceive it, and to accept it. And what people who really see the gospel's reaction to it will be like. Think about what I just said. How do you react to the good news of Jesus Christ? Because in this parable, it makes it sound like a person found something and it's so important that everything about his life changed. It literally says he found this treasure in a field and because of it, he went off and joyfully sold all he had, divested himself of everything, not for nothing, but because he found something that was more valuable than everything else. Yeah. Is that your story? Is that your story? Does it look like you found something so valuable that all the stuff outside this place just looks like nothing next to it? Even the good stuff, even the beautiful stuff. Is it so small compared to this beautiful life, this treasure that you found? Romans 14, 17 says this, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of Christ, all the same thing. It's not a matter of eating and drinking. He's talking, obviously, in the book of Romans to Jews. He's not just saying you shouldn't eat or drink. You could take it both ways, but the truth is he's saying it's not a matter of ceremony or you know eating and drinking and festivals and, and religious observance. It's a matter of what? Righteousness. Right standing with God. And because of right standing with God, what do we have that we never had before? Peace. Do you have peace? Do you walk around this place a nervous wreck waiting for the next phone call or the next, hopefully the next thing works out or are you just at peace? Like all that other stuff's just going to work itself out. Are you at peace? Because if you really understand who God is and you realize because of Christ you are right with him, what, a, what? doesn't mean nothing in this world matters, but nothing matters that much. Like the author of the great song who lost his family in a tragic accident, you will be able to say, it is well with my soul. And if you're at peace with God, you'll experience something that you've never had before. Not happiness, joy. Don't we know that happiness isn't a bad thing, but happiness is something that depends on the happenings of your life. That's what the etymology of the word means. That you're in a good situation. Things are working out for you. And it brings a state of contentment into your life that is temporary. But joy is something that this world cannot give you. And it is something that this world cannot take away. It is something a situation in your life does not give you. And no situation in your life can take away. It doesn't mean you don't mourn when you lose something. It doesn't mean you don't struggle or hurt or have pain because of the trials of life. But it means underneath the surface there is a peace and a joy that is evidence that the Spirit of God is living in you. Listen, don't take your own word for what the Spirit of God living in you looks like. Take God's word for it. Look at the book of, of Galatians chapter 5 where it says, listen, the fruit of the Spirit, which means the evidence that you actually are a Christian is this, love. The love of God that you've embraced. And that love brings you what? Joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness. And self-control. <clears throat> the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and then covered up again. And then he goes in joy and sells all he has and buys the field. Here's the point. It's a simple point. The kingdom of God is so valuable, so very valuable, 
that trading every bit of worldly comfort, money, treasures, hopes, dreams, success, anything of value that you could have obtained in this life is worth bankrupting yourself of that to obtain this. Now, please understand this. Here's what the parable is not saying. Don't, don't misunderstand the point of the parable. It's not saying that you have to buy the gospel. You have to buy entry to heaven. It's just a parable. You can't, you know, what is the field? What is the, what is the, the you know, the treasure? What is all this stuff? Trying to find like all these allegoric symbolisms. That's not what it's saying. There's a simple point. The treasure is the kingdom of God. And finding it is so valuable that nothing else in life is worth comparing to it. And here's the just the, the takeaway you have to have from this. Does your life look like that? Does your life look like that? Come on, don't, don't push past this because I preach this way every week. Does your life look like, your experience with God look like an encounter that made everything else meaningless? I mean, I remember thinking I was going to prison in this program and coming to the conclusion that maybe God wanted me to go be a missionary there. Did I want to go? Of course not. Of course I, I wanted to stay with my wife. But I'll be honest with you. When I truly came to know who Christ was, my wife fell into a far second. My hopes and dreams fell way off the map. My plans for my life decreased and some of some of you sitting in here can't even really put some girlfriend you're not even supposed to have on the altar some career that you're you know you've got waiting for when you come out of here you don't see jesus you can't i mean what is what is jesus saying here he's not saying he don't want you to have any of these things or that you're not going to have anything good in life that's not what i'm saying I'm saying, what's first place in your life? And listen, in the first century context, the word treasure, it don't mean that much to us because we're rich. You don't think about yourself this way, but you are stinking, filthy, rich. You're going to go down and eat a, a, a great meal for dinner tonight. You're going to sleep on a nice bed. You're going to be comfortable. Everybody in here has got nice, new-looking clothes. You may not like yours because they're not the same name brand as the guy next to you or because, you know, yours are a little older than his, but I don't see anybody in here that has any real needs, any human needs, a lot of human wants. In the first century, the idea of treasure was something huge. See, these people, if they didn't work, they didn't eat. And if you didn't have the ability to work, you begged, like we talked about last time we were together. The idea of treasure was some far pie in the sky idea. They didn't live in the land of plenty. The idea that you would find some treasure so valuable that it would supply all of your needs was not something that was going to happen. This is like folklore and stories they would tell each other, just like we do when we think we're going to find some sort of pirate's treasure. Or in our day and age that we're going to spend $5 of our hard-earned money and hit the lottery. The point is this. The kingdom of God is so very valuable that trading every bit of everything in this life, including your life, should just be something easy. And if it's not, you don't see Jesus. And it's not that the, the other stuff's not valuable. It's that the value of the treasure is worth so much more. So much more. Losing everything in this life, including your life, is a happy trade-off for the kingdom of God. And brothers, this is what conversion looks like. If you said a prayer in a church one day that you repeated after a pastor, and your entire life changed after that, like everything about your life changed, then maybe you were saved then, right? But if you walked out of there and went got in your car and a day or an hour or a week later, you're back in the old same life, everything changes. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure. 
This is saying the kingdom of heaven is valuable. And Jesus is saying it's more valuable than anything in this world. And those who are truly saved by the gospel and the grace of God will listen. First, they will see and perceive the value of the treasure. You got to see God for who he is. You got to see yourself for who you are. You got to find yourself in the situation you're really in. And then you'll see grace as this beautiful gift, this treasure. Then you'll live a, a life that makes you look stupid in front of people. I, I, I'm happy to be a fool for God. I'm happy to have people snicker and say, man, he's radical. It's not, I love God. And I want God to know it. And I want you to know it. Because I want God to know that I want you to know. And I'm proud. I'm proud to look stupid for him. I'm proud to be happy about it. Because if you don't see my joy and understand it, it's because I know something you don't know. And I want you to know it. What is more valuable than seeing God, the God of Scripture, as a reality and seeing how this God redirected the course of history to save wretches like you and me. Think about the most important business person. The most important person you know in this world. A president or a king or the CEO of Apple or someone. And this is like a tiny, tiny, tiny example. Think about some movie star, some LeBron James type sports figure. Someone who just has everything at their disposal. And that would be like all of a sudden them knowing about you and them re redirecting the entirety of their resource towards you. And they're going to rewrite history to receive you and send his son to die for you. And make all these millions of little things happen throughout the course of history. Divide Red Seas and cause prophecies to come to pass. And, and make these miracles happen in a wretch's life like you and me. And all of a sudden you realize it all along from the time you were born. And hundreds and thousands of years before you were born. God was interceding for you. And it's like all the, you just been living your life like an animal, like a fool. And you're just walking along one day and you bump into something. You're just working in this field. What's going on? What is this? No, surely not. What is this? Oh my goodness, this is everything. It's everything. I wonder how much, I can't just walk out of here with the treasure. Maybe I could buy the field. Wonder how much it cost. Honey, how much we got in the bank? Oh, it's not going to be enough to buy the field. Sell the house. Pull the kids out of college. Sell all your stuff. Sell all my guitar. Do anything. I found something. You're not, you don't get it. Just do it. Sell all our stocks. Sell our cars. Get rid of everything. I know it sounds crazy, but I found something. So valuable. All we got to do is buy this field. <clears throat> if that's all true and you really know it and you're really being saved by it, could your reaction be anything less than that? Anything less. I'm not saying it's the first time you heard the gospel or the first time you went to church or that you were even acting like a Christian, going through the motions, saying stuff. Hey, amen, brother. Amen to you too. Hallelujah. I'm talking about the moment where you realized it's all true. It's all real. Is there anything conceivably more valuable than that? That the God of the universe redirected history, life, sent his son, made prophecies come to pass, made every point in history point to a savior who was on a mission to save you. Is there anything more valuable than that? The answer is no. This is why Jesus calls it treasure. Of course, I have to work my favorite scripture into this. 
The Apostle Paul didn't think there was anything more valuable than Christ. In Philippians 3.7, he says, Listen, whatever were gains to me, I now count as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Not begrudgingly. Not like, God, look at all I gave up for you. Look at all I gave up to come to Teen Challenge. Look at all I gave up for you, honey. Look what I've done for us. Look what I did. Paul saying, everything. My place is a Pharisee. My Roman citizenship, my future, prestige, power, money, hope, streams, plans. It's all just garbage because I see Jesus and he accepts me. You think a guy sitting in a trap house as the music's pumping, smoking a glass pipe, thinking about Jesus like that? You think a guy that's living his life day after day after day with no thought towards God sees Jesus as a treasure? See, listen, Christians get engaged in sin, but when they do, it's like hell because they do know who God is and they can't, they can't do it. It, like, it tears them to pieces. I'm not saying you'll never sin again. I'm saying you'll never like sin again. And you'll do anything to get, get away from it. You'll come to a place like this. You'll, you'll cry at the altar. You'll get in your Bible and won't get out. You'll go in your prayer closet and you won't come out. Not because you're trying to earn something with God. It's because you love Him and you've seen Him and you know who He is. And you know that no sacrifice or effort or thing that you divest yourself in this life can even come close to what He gave up for you. Listen, you don't inherit the kingdom because you were born into it. You can't buy it. You can't earn it. The kingdom of God is a gift. And listen, it's a gift for those who want it more than anything else. That's what he's saying. Listen, there's a lot of these parables where there's this sort of comparison made. Not saying you have to earn it or buy it or do anything for it. It's a gift. It'd be like a child who went into a, a, a toy store. And he's in this toy store. It's one of the stores that's got like little shiny little things that shake and make noise for a dollar. And like thousands of dollars like go-karts. Segas and whatever you guys play now. PS1s or 10s or whatever they are. I don't know. <laughs> this doesn't matter, but Dan, the bass player, and his wife talked to me into playing Mario Kart the other day and uh you know I don't but I did get a little hooked into it man I was trying to like got it it was pretty fun exciting it has nothing to do with the sermon but anyways I haven't played video games in many years but it was it was pretty fun <clears throat> but you're in a toy store and the owner of the toy store tells you listen you can have anything you want as long as you want it more than anything else in here so you go get the most expensive thing in the store you gotta, it's just in this box. Dad's saying, listen, it's just, just let's just say it's a $1,000 go-kart. And you're like, oh, taking it. Dad's like, but listen, you can't play with it for a year. Because you know, Mom said, you can't have a go-kart till you're 10 and you're 9. So we're going to, do you really want this go-kart? And he's like, oh, that's a long time. Man, I sure do like Silly Putty. And the owner's like, fine, take the Silly Putty. If you want the Silly Putty, you don't get the go-kart you got to want it more than anything else. And listen, this is what Jesus is saying. There is no second place for God. There is no version where you work God into the, the, the construct of your life. He is everything or He is nothing. Here's what it doesn't look like. Mark 10 verse 17 says this, And he, as he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and kneeled before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And then Jesus said to him, 
Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And then he said to him, Teacher, I've kept all these from my youth. And Jesus looked at him and loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go sell all you have. Give to the poor. Then you'll have treasure in heaven. And then come follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Isn't that what we want? We want eternal life? We want Jesus? Hey God, what must I do to get that eternal life? I'm glad you asked. Jesus said, you want eternal life on your own power, in your own goodness, then follow the law perfectly. And either he was self-deceived or dishonest or whatever. Maybe he was just confused. He said, well, I've done all these things. See, he wouldn't hit the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus taught. And Jesus said, look, you ever looked at a woman with lust? You ever been angry at someone for a minute? You murder, you adulterer. He didn't get the, the benefit of that sermon. So Jesus doesn't spend the whole time recounting the Sermon on the Mount for him. He just looks at him in the sermon and says, listen, here's, what, here's where the issue is with you. Here's the thing that separates you and me. It's your possessions. It's, it's simple. If you see me as the good Lord, go sell all your stuff. But guess what? You're going to have treasure in heaven. But he didn't really seem that concerned about eternal life, did he? He was more concerned about this life. He said he had great possessions. That's why later in this verse, this chapter of Scripture, it says how hard it is for the rich to inherit the kingdom of heaven. It's harder than, than, than a camel going through the eye of a needle. Any of you got great wealth? We have lots of possessions in here. Or do you just got, maybe a couple of you own a house, I don't know. Maybe your wife has a house. Maybe you got a place to go home. I mean, what do you got? What do you, what do you got in this life that you're going to hold on to at the expense of treasure in heaven? <coughs> really? <Yeah. coughs> don't you realize that this, this is being lukewarm? I talk about this a lot. This is being casual about Jesus. This is being like he's something you add into your life. Jesus ain't something you put in your portfolio. Okay, I got a good job. I got a good wife. I got a good house. I got eternal life. Check, check, check. No, either you got Jesus as all in all or you don't got him. Don't you realize there won't be lukewarm Christians in heaven? There won't be casual Christians in heaven? There won't be people that kind of, sort of, thought about God every once in a while in heaven? There will be people, there will be no people in heaven that didn't see Jesus as a treasure that consumed their life. They won't be there. Even if you lived a poor life, even the thief on the cross saw the value of the man hanging next to him. Oh, forgive me, God. I deserve to be up here. Please remember me in paradise. And in grace, Jesus said, surely you'll be with me today. But he saw the value. And in that moment, a good God saved him. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field. It's not like a rich young ruler who goes away sad when Jesus says, I'm worth more than everything else. And then Jesus tells another parable. It's exactly the same. He says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding a pearl of great value, sold all he had so he could have it. And again and again and again he tells this story.
So I didn't come up with this, this analogy that I'm doing here, comparing the rich young ruler to the person I'm about to connect it to. This is the, the preaching of Martin Lloyd-Jones that did this. But it's a great analogy. It's a great comparison because we got on one hand, we got the rich young ruler, right? This guy who didn't see the, the kingdom as valuable as anything. He was a man of great wealth. He wouldn't give it up because he didn't see Christ as treasure. And then in Luke 19, we see what a treasure in a field looks like, what a real conversion looks like. In Luke 19, 1, it says, He entered into Jericho and was passing through, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. And he was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he wanted to see Jesus. He'd heard about him. He wanted to get a look at him. So he ran ahead and climbed up a sycamore tree to see him. For he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up at him and said, Zacchaeus, hurry, come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And then when he saw it, they all grumbled. And then he had gone in to be the guest of this man who is a sinner. And then Zacchaeus stood and said, Lord, behold, half of the goods I have I will give to the poor. And if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I will restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, truly today salvation has come to this house. Since he is also a son of Abraham, for the son of man came to seek and save that which is lost. Now we all understand from previous sermons what a tax collector was. And in case you don't know, a tax collector in this context was a Jewish man who collected taxes from his own people, from the oppressors who were Romans. And typically they would have to buy their tax collector franchise. It would cost them a lot of money. And basically they would make this huge investment. And they would receive a huge reward for it because they could tax them and pay the taxes to Rome and they could also put whatever they wanted on top of it. Make up all sort of fake penalties and this is what tax collectors did. And basically he gave his life up as a Jew to be a tax collector. You understand that? So it wasn't like he's just some job he had. Listen, he was working for the enemy, hated by his brothers, and he'd invested his entire life into being a tax collector. And meeting Jesus and seeing him as valuable, it says joyfully, he said, listen, I'm going to give half of my possessions to the poor. I'm just going to take half of what I, he's a rich and insanely rich man. But you can take half of it and give it to the poor. You know what I'm going to keep the other half for? I'm going to make right all the people I've wronged. Four times. And he did it joyfully. Why? Because salvation had come to his house. He saw Jesus, a Savior who looked at him and said, Come down. I'm going to go to your house, you filthy tax collector. I'm going to break bread at your table. And he saw Christ. And he divested himself of earthly gain for the sake of Jesus. Well, how about the woman at the well? who ran off and immediately evangelized her town. Or how about Matthew <coughs> leaving his tax collector's booth? Listen, the cost of following Jesus was high for these people. But it was worth it. <laughs> and I say this a lot. There isn't two classes of Christians. Nowhere in the Bible. There's not two classes of Christians. There are people who live by faith as they follow Jesus, and there's people who shrink back and are destroyed. If you don't react like Zacchaeus, or the woman at the well, or Matthew, or the apostle Paul, or like the man who found the treasure in the field, and see that treasure is so valuable that you would sell anything, abandon anything to have it, it's because you don't see Jesus. You don't perceive his value. You don't know who he is. I have no problem saying that to you. I have no problem asking you to examine your life and what you love in this world and what you build your life around. There isn't going to be lukewarm people in heaven. There's nothing lukewarm about the gospel. 
There's nothing casual about the gospel. If anything is more valuable to you, then you don't truly see Christ. Which means you're not saved. There is no parable that says there was a man who saw a treasure in the field, but was unwilling to sell anything to buy it. And he went back and looked at his stuff and thought, well, maybe I'll come and buy the treasure later. Maybe the treasure's valuable. Let's do let's get a spreadsheet working here. I wonder if it's gonna pay off in the future. Oh, carry the one. The world, the treasure, Jesus, my life, what I want. I wrote a book called Hard Sayings. It's in the library. In chapter two, there's a there's a chapter called Laodicea America. <clears throat> and I pick on American Christianity often. Not because it's my hobby horse, but because I'm afraid that for many people it will be their destruction. Seeing Jesus as casual. Seeing church as something where you go and you have a little fellowship and get a donut. I'm watching pastors all across this country that are shaming other pastors who are standing for God in the middle of the climate we're living in right now. And other pastors are are running around trying to make sure they're not offending godless people. People in in politics. Because they want both desperately. They want the people of the church to accept them. And they want this world to think well of them too. They don't want to offend the baby killers. And the people that endorse every kind of sexual immorality. Because guess what they have? They got power. And other people want power. That's why you watch actors. When they say something on Twitter or whatever that, that they wish they wouldn't have said. And then their agent comes and goes, oh, you're going to mess your career. And then they go on an apology tour. They say, ain't nobody living any lives of conviction out in this world. They're all living for self-preservation and power and success. Something who loves Jesus will shine brightly in that. We just stand there for the glory of God. Woe to you when all men think well of you. There's nothing lukewarm about being a Christian. There's nothing casual about being a Christian. There's not a Christian in the New Testament that looked at the treasure of Christ and acted like it was something common. And even the only person before the resurrection who, who kind of fell, Peter, he didn't do it in some way. He goes, well, well. Try the Jesus thing. He was brokenhearted because he didn't understand because he just watched his Savior die. And so he denied him out of fear. But he wasn't casual about it. He was brokenhearted about it with conviction, pain. We'll get to this, this sermon eventually, but in Revelation 3, 14, it says, To the angel of the church of Laodicea write these words, the words of the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works, Because you're neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were either hot or cold. So because you were lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you from my mouth. There's a great book I'm going to put in the library that Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote about this. The Intersection of the Church of Laodicea. the, the, The story of Zacchaeus. The story of the rich young ruler. He's a mighty man of God. He tells the story way better than I can. But in this moment, I want you to see something. What happens to the people that are casual and lukewarm? What happens to them? Are they Christians? There's no such thing as a lukewarm Christian. Listen, if you're a Christian, Jesus ain't going to spew you from his mouth. He's not going to talk this way about you. Like the rich young ruler said, listen, I'm standing in front of something that's of infinite value, a treasure. But I'm rich. And I've prospered. Verse 17 of of chapter 3 of Revelation. I'm rich, I've prospered, I need nothing. Not realizing that I'm actually wretched and pitiful and poor and blind and naked. Jesus says, listen, I counsel from you to buy gold from me refined in fire. 
so that you will actually be rich, so you will have treasure in heaven, so you'll really have something valuable because this world is burning up and passing away in a moment. He wants to give us white garments to clothe ourselves with. This sounds like salvation talk to me. And cover your shameful nakedness so it may not be seen. And anoint your eyes with, with salve so you can see. To those I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous. You know what zealous means? It means be intense and repent. Repent. Jesus is saying, listen. Just like the rich young ruler, he says, listen. I love you. And here's why I'm about to tell you what I'm telling you. Sell all your stuff. Get rid of it. Get rid of your stuff. Have treasure in heaven. And I know you were talking about saying a prayer. That ain't about a prayer. Get rid of your stuff and follow me. And he said no. <clears throat> you can't value anything above the treasure in the field. The way you react to the gospel shows whether or not you really have it. Not just in a moment, in the way your life goes. This guy didn't make a momentary sort of like grabbing of the gospel. He made some life-altering decisions. Like he divested himself of everything, sold everything to have the treasure in the field. How can I say this? How can I say that you're not in Christ? It's because of what Jesus is saying. We're going to go through a lot of parables. We're going to see this is the primary thing that Jesus talks about. How do I know this for sure? Because Jesus says this, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Matthew 6, 19 says this, listen, don't lay up for yourself treasures on earth. You want to like try to like dig deep into that, find what it means? It means don't lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust can destroy, where neither thieves break in and steal. Listen, for where your treasure is, there your heart is also. He says the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is unhealthy, your whole body, your, if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, then your whole body will be full of darkness. If then that light is darkness in you, how great is that darkness? What is he saying there? Listen, a blind person don't know how bright the sun is. You're not reacting to the gospel of Christ because you don't see him. You see the treasures of this world because you love this world and the things in this world. If you can actually see your whole body is full of light, this eye determines the reality of what you see. And if your eyes haven't been opened to the value and the glory and the infinite just majesty of Jesus, then you don't know him. If your life isn't filled with joy because of your salvation, if you're not at peace, you don't know him. I'm not shaming you. I'm telling you, it's time to make a decision to follow Jesus. And not because I'm trying to persuade you to, but because your eyes are open to the infinite value of Jesus. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. You can't serve yourself. You know what it's really saying? You can't serve yourself. You can't be king of your own life. You're going to either live your life trusting him or trusting yourself. Following your wants and desires or following his. Following Jesus or following yourself. Jesus is the treasure in the field. There's nothing casual or lukewarm about selling everything you have to buy a field. Listen, when you see people giving up things that this world calls valuable... And they don't see the same value in it than you do. They think you are crazy. There's people in my family that think I'm crazy for being here. What are you still doing there? You got a master's degree. Go, go make some money. That's where God has called me. 
I'm at peace. I am free. You know where I want to be? I want to be in God's will. And you know when I'm going to move? When he sets a bush on fire and tells me to go. And I'm going to have to make sure. You sure? Because I don't want to be out of your will, God. I can't ever be out of your will again. I can't do it on my own anymore. I'm not begging you to ask Jesus in your heart. I'm shouting like a madman to get you to see the infinite value of Jesus. I want you to see him as so valuable that you would be willing to fling your life away in a moment like it's nothing. That's what we're asking you to do here. You came here to get off drugs? I'm asking you to see Jesus. Fling your life away for him. Take everything you have and just... <sighs> yours. What are, what's your plans after Teen Challenge? I don't know. Still praying about it. Haven't heard from God yet. I don't know. How can you know if he ain't told you? You know where you're going? How can you know where you're going when you're supposed to be following somebody? You know where you're going? Did he tell you? Oh, you can lie to yourself like guys that have left recently that looked me square in the eye and said, well, Jesus told me to leave. Jesus told me to go follow my dreams. I don't know what God said to you, but I've been doing this a long time. Don't, don't really sound like, don't really look like I'm not the God of your life. I wish you well. John, 1 John 2.15 says this. Don't love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, listen, the love of God, the love of the Father is not in them. For all the things of the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life is not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires will pass away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. I know we're running a little over. Just give me a second here. We can't skip past the closing part because it's the most important part. Let's not skip past the most crucial part. Apocaros. Apocaros. It's the Greek word, the Greek phrase for with joy. With joy. This explains the reason why the guy sold the stuff to get the thing in the field. Listen, I'm not asking you to begrudgingly surrender your life to God. Legalism and works-based theology ain't going to get you nowhere. It's going to wear you out and make you tired. I'm asking you to see Jesus to the point that with joy you abandon the world. With a smile on your face. Listen. In closing, it, it doesn't say there won't be sacrifice. It says that if the enduring value of Christ is, means more to you than anything else, that any sacrifice will be tiny. It'll be worth it. It'll even be joyous. And here's the point of everything, so listen. Listen. If you aren't willing to sell everything with joy, it's because you don't know Jesus. Welcome to biblical Christianity, built on the foundation of the apostles and on Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone, a Christ who laid his life down for you, apostles who laid their life down for the establishment of the word. Is he valuable? Is he treasure? I'm not trying to guilt you into trying harder. I'm trying to whet your appetite to see if maybe the joy and peace of the universe is in this book. That there's a God in heaven who wants to live inside of you and actually change the way you see life. That's what we were talking about the other day, Will. God is changing you. He's changing you from the inside out. And who cares who knows it? Jesus is more valuable than anything in this life. And that's all I want for you to do is focus on that. Find the Jesus of the Bible. And there you'll find peace, joy, even that self-control that you came here looking for. You find it in abandoning control of your life to a God who loves you, a God who came to save you, and a God that will preserve you to the end.
Jesus is that treasure, and the gospel is our means to inherit it. Lord, I thank you so much for the time I get to spend with these men. Lord, I know, I know, I know that you have to open the eyes of our heart, Lord. I just read all these church fathers and theologians who say it so many different ways, God. There's a thousand ways to say it, but it's all the same thing. You are the supreme treasure of the universe. Jesus, the name above all names. Lord, I pray that you would you would grab hold of some of these men's gaze. Lord, I know it ain't going to be all of them, Lord, because narrow is the path and only a few find it. But I pray that a few of the men in this room find it. Lord, I really hope that all of them find it. But I pray that the, the lost sheep, Lord, in this room will respond to the call of your voice. And Lord, that they'll see that you're better, you're more beautiful, you're worth everything, God. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.